Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we partition systems into microservices. And part of the reason that I really got prompted to have this discussion is that I've been beginning to see consistently lots of bad decisions about how people are partitioning. So people get the idea that, hey, my team is going to own a microservice and we're going to work on that microservice and we're going to be independent from other teams working on their microservices. But quite often the boundaries that I see people picking are really just quite arbitrary. Hey, what's your team going to do? Maybe we should do this project? Okay, well, that's going to be a microservice. right? And we're going to get ourselves into a lot of difficulty. And particularly, there's a real nasty anti-pattern called effectively um, uh, entity services, where essentially your service is a microservice and it just does some CRUD operation. It says, up, create one of these, read one of these, update one of these, and delete one of these. Yay, I'm a microservice, and you're not. Right? So a little bit of a conversation today will be about what is a microservice, just to clarify that, and then we will talk, given that understanding of what a microservice is, how do we find it? And I apologize for those of you who are bored with the conversation of what is a microservice. We will try and perhaps do it a little bit of a different context. Oh my, most of this is dull. I'm old. That's pretty much what that says. I am another old white guy. Please, we want less old white guys here. If we could have a bit more diversity, that'd be great. Um, what I said at the bottom basically effectively is, you know, um, I am not smarter than you. I am just fortunate enough to have basically had the right opportunities to get to stand here. Um, all of you could do this. Please speak at user groups. Speak, please do lightning uh, talks. Please work your way up to get to basically work to speak in front of people. It's a lot of fun. You learn a lot. You get to travel the world. Um, we need less middle-aged white guys, right? Okay. I also work on an open source product called Brighter. There are some people who work on Brighter in the front. Raise your hands, you two. Go on, hope, but you hand a little higher. <laughs> um, and uh, we're hopefully very friendly. At least those two are, anyway. Um, uh, and if you want to get involved in an open source project, we do with messaging systems, and we kind of mediate alike, if you know that from C Sharp, but we also do between microservices. We have a Python version called Brightside. The Python version we really do with some friends. Um, uh, and we also really, most of us work in things like platforms like AWS or RabbitMQ on Prime, et cetera. And we really could do with some Azure people to come and uh, help with our Azure transport. So please come along and help. Um, what's today's agenda? Um, we'll talk about this idea of really what's called products versus projects. And really that is a key to understanding what microservices are about. Um, when we basically move on from that, we'll get into this idea of componentization via services, and that's when we will describe what the characteristics of a microservice are that are important to understand how to create partitions. Then we'll talk about this notion of organized around business capabilities. So Fowler and Lewis in their original paper on microservice said they are organized around business capabilities. What does that mean? What is a business capability and how do I organize my microservice around it, right? People read that sentence, and I, I don't know many people who necessarily know what that means. Um, we'll also mention bounded context in there. We'll talk about why that's a bit of a red herring. Um, and we'll get in then into a sort of segue at the end, independent operability, because it's just a nice little finish up to tell you about some of the things you will then gain from this process. OK, products, not projects. Anyone heard this particular phrase before, products, not projects? So the idea behind products, not projects, is that your team should be working on a product, not a project. Right? So in other words, here is a thing that we are building. We are going to continually iterate on. We are going to make it better. And we're going to get basically success through making a better version of this. Not on the 15th, could we have done this? Right. Very different strategies. Anyone, anyone know who Adrian Cockcroft is? So Adrian Cockcroft is the, was the lead architect in Netflix. So if you watch Netflix, this is the guy that built a lot of what you use. And he was, this is the people that came up with effectively things like Hysterix, Zool, et cetera, a whole range of open source products, some of which you may use, if you're, particularly if you're in Java land. And they called basically what the approach they were doing fine-grained SOA, so fine-grained service-oriented architectures. Um, 
And they are one of the people, along probably with, say, uh, the famous Jeff Bezos email at Amazon, which effectively said, you know, your team basically is going to build a service. It's going to stick it behind an API. I don't care what the API uses. And no one talks to basically your database apart from you. Otherwise, I fire you. Um, the famous Vsauce email, basically. Uh, and they are probably the two groups that really originate what we think of today a lot as microservices. Um, people like James Lewis and Martin Fowler were really representing what they saw out there in the marketplace. And Adrian said this important thing. Speed wins in the marketplace. What does he mean by that? What he meant by that is he now believes that it is table stakes in most industries where you want to be competitive to release multiple times per day. If you are releasing every two weeks, that is no longer good enough. If you are releasing every month, you have probably lost. Okay. And the way to essentially achieve that speed is microservices. So what's the problem? So if I have a monolith, and typically, and I'm a successful business, then it's likely that I'm going to need to have multiple teams working on my monolith. A team is probably less than 12 peep, pizza, people. Amazon uses this model of two pizzas. Some folks like to think of it as five plus or minus two, so up to about seven. But generally, probably you or I would accept if somebody said, you are the team lead, and there are 40 people in your team, we'd probably go, I don't really want that job. Thanks very much. Um, at the team leader 12, I might go, really? Um, six would be good. Okay. So if I'm going to basically break up my organization into a number of teams, I'm going to get a problem if the way that I've organized my software is a monolith. And the problem I'm going to get is that all those teams want to release the code that they've been working on in, at the same time quite often. Right. So what tends to happen is my teams go away, and we've got some repo that represents the monolith, and they will basically branch. And they will create some feature branches that say, we're working on, working on this feature, because we don't all want to be working on a constantly moving target, which master would be with multiple teams inside it. If we've got like 50 developers, it's going to be hard. So we branch basically our code, and we go away, and we work, and we deliver and build our feature, and we get it working. But the trouble is everybody else is branched, and so we're not integrated with them. So now we have to go through integration. And so we say, right, well, we're going to release, and we're going to release basically on the, on the 15th, we're going to release our new feature. And then usually what happens, because everybody knows it takes time to release now in this model, everyone else goes, oh, we'd like to release as well. And you get a whole lot of people stacked up basically to release. And generally what happens is you have some kind of meeting, and in the meeting, effectively, all the wise people sit around and they say, what's going to be in this release? And we all agree and sign up and say, that's going to be ready, this is going to be ready, effectively, et cetera, and we get to have this release meeting. And ops are there, and everyone gets very excited. Um, and then effectively what happens on the 15th, hopefully, everybody checks in their code and says we're ready to go. Sometimes some people are a bit of a laggard. We then get a bit of delay in the process. And we're trying to decide, well, could you go in the next release? And then they know that release is going to take time. As we see from the process, they don't want that to happen. So they fight to be allowed into the release. So you may get a delay to the beginning of your release process. We then we'll integrate our software, and then we have to test it because we now have to test all these integrated branches to see if basically anything breaks. Something undoubtedly breaks, and then we play pin the tail on the donkey. Because it's not my team's fault that's broken, it's your team's fault that that team's broken. So some poor soul gets the job, probably the person doesn't move fast enough out of the way, having to diagnose exactly whose fault this problem is, then go to that team and say, hey, guys, your code is broken. They fight about it for a while. Um, and eventually, that team accepts they need to fix the, fix the bugs. They fix the bugs. They, reintroduce, they basically put the bugs back and check that into the code. We retest everything. Okay. And generally, what's happening is time is now elapsing. Okay. At some point, we may even get to the really horrible situation where we say, your code is so buggy that we're not going to get out for this date. And I'm desperate to get out for this date because I promised the customers I was going to go to go out on the 18th. And now we're going to be late because your code, which you checked in from your team, which you don't need out until the 25th or whatever, um, is too buggy for me to, me to put out. And then you have to hold the horrible decision of, can we reverse out your code? Right. 
And maybe if we're lucky, we've got feature switches, and we can say, yeah, we could deploy your code, just all the switches turned off. Right? That may be a, good, a, a better world to be in. But often, in my experience, this process takes about two weeks. And it becomes kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately, that because we know that it takes two weeks to release anything, nobody wants to miss the next release train window for their software. And so we end up in this world we can't release faster than two weeks, and actually we may release every month. And if our competitor is releasing every single day, what's going to happen is the sales team are going to go to the CTO and they're going to say to the CTO, mm, the development team is very unproductive. All of our competitors release much more software than we do, much faster. And our customers say that basically we're too slow at releasing stuff, right? That's an uncomfortable conversation when it happens. So how do you fix that, right? How do you fix that release cycle problem? So microservices are around slicing up our software so that your team just owns a portion which it can deploy independently of any other team. So I don't need to join the release train anymore. My bit of code that deals with, um, we're, looking at, we're going to look at a hotel example uh, later, which basically deals with what happens at check-in for the customer basically into our hotel. I can add new features around that. I can make life better, basically, for the person working on the front desk and for the customer. I can, I can do all that work. And essentially, I just release when as soon as, I, as soon as it's ready. As soon as the story moves into the swim lane that says, done, done, I can ship it. Because I'm not waiting on, on, micro, on, on this team or that team. I don't have to integrate with them. I've probably developed on master as a team with a behind a feature switch in case, effectively, we have multiple pieces of work, but generally speaking, even in that model, the best thing to do is try and have your devs all swarming on one story at a time to move through the chain. So you can just release that story out and get it out the door, right? Simplify everything. And your goal is to make it possible for that team to ship without having to talk to any other team in the organization. And they just keep iterating, making the product better, releasing multiple times a day. If there's a, if there's a defect, it's very easy for them to release the code and just get a new version out very rapidly. And that's what a microservice is. Ultimately, beyond all the noise about what you may think about lines of code, everything else, the sole purpose of microservice is to allow teams to independently deploy. That's the, that's the, reason, that's the whole reason behind it. Okay. And that's why folks say, if there's only four of you, you don't need microservices. Because if there's only four of you, you're probably only working on one thing, and you can just release it, right? It doesn't really matter whether it's a monolith or a, mic or, or a microservice in, in a structure. And your monolith can be a distributed system. So one of the things that sometimes people say, I want to do microservices, and what they mean is I want to do distributed systems, because I want to scale parts of my platform independently from it from another. The web process that takes in HTTP requests may not be basically to scale the same way the worker process that reads work you've put on a queue scales at. That's a distributed system. A monolith can be a distributed system, right? Microservices is about alignment of teams to parts of your system to allow them to move on an independent schedule. So this notion Sam Newman calls out a lot, basically, independent deployability. That's the key characteristic you're looking for. And you have to ask yourself for any microservice if you believe you are doing microservices. Here's the question you have to ask yourself is, is it independently deployable? And that leads to this useful model called product mode rather than project mode. So in project mode, what tends to happen is the head of product has some roadmap and talks to all his product managers and says, we need to build this stuff on the roadmap. And they go out to basically the whole pool of developers and they say, right, we need to take X developers from the pool and we're going to put them on this part of the roadmap and they're going to work on delivering this feature. And if you're uh, lucky, essentially, the same developers will tend to be working on the same bits of the code most of the time. But if you're not, you just get randomly assigned a bit of the code and told to ship a feature. And the key driver is usually a date. Right? We measure success by, did we hit the date? That's pretty useless, because the date doesn't actually have any real business value. So product mode says, I work on a portion of the product. 
I work on something like how we do check-in, how we um, do check-out, how we basically make rooms available for customers to do booking, how, what the booking process works like, how the payment system works, right? And I have a backlog of work, and I simply take the next most important item out of the backlog and I do it. And we measure success by business-facing numbers. Did we basically increase the revenue from a typical customer journey into our basically site by 10%? Did the time it took for the customer to complete basically the check-in process drop from five minutes to two? Did we get less customers signing onto our site and then walking away after 30 seconds in frustration because the whole thing is so bad they can't use it? Those are the numbers that move the dial, not can we get something out on the 16th? And to do that, you essentially work around a product. The team and the product manager are focused on shipping a better version of this product. And that has huge advantages if, you, if you're a software developer because, hey, the, the, the effort I put into making this better results in a better product. And the team and I will all succeed. So it's worth me fixing that rubbishy code to make it easier for us to basically deploy more quickly. It's worth basically me having us basically make, putting all the effort into getting the UX right so customers can use it. Because we see tangible rewards. I'm no longer motivated by, I have to hit this date, and I'll do what's ever necessary to hit this date. And I'm motivated by, I need to move the dial on the success of the business by making sure that this part of the product achieves our overall goals as an organization better. Right. That's why it's quite often aligned to things like OKRs, basically, if you use those in your organization that filter down from the top. You're looking for key metrics that you're trying to shift instead, basically, of hitting particular dates. All right. Componentization via services. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, just a second before me, uh, the history of microservices. <coughs> I'll do this reasonably quickly. Um, but it's just useful, I think, to understand uh, where this came from. So once upon a time, uh, we, some of us were unlucky enough to write things like COM and CORBA. And there's a version of COM called DCOM. And so COM is a basically a binary interop standard between um, components. And it let you write a component like a library in C++ and call it from Visual Basic. Once upon a time, the world consisted of client server apps written in Visual Basic or Power Builder talking to C++ components via a COM standard. Okay, if I wanted to put that COM component running something out somewhere else, I had to use a tool called DCOM. DCOM was distributed COM, right? The problem with DCOM is it was very hard to get working. Essentially, the security behind it made it very difficult for you to call from basically one machine to another. And in the end, what would happen in frustration, you would just say, open all the ports. Um, this didn't go down well with security guys, and so DCOM was basically not succeeding very well. Along comes a guy called Dombox. So I had Dombox. Okay, Dombox is a Microsofty, famous basically for working on COM. So broken and a WCF, for example, was basically Dombox. I'm so broken by that experience. He now works on Xbox and gaming, I think. Um, but he came, he came up with this idea and said, "Well, port 80 is always open. So what I could do is simply call the other object over port 80. And what I'll do to make this simple, because it's kind of a hack, I'll basically put in XML the name of the method I want to call in the parameters." And I'll send that via HTTP over port 80. And on the other side, I'll have something that essentially sits there and listens to the HTTP request like a server and actually makes the in-process call effectively to my com object, basically the local call to my com object, basically, with these parameters and that method name, and gets the result back. And then effectively, I can send the result back over HTTP and I can marshal that into the, into the uh, calling object, basically, as the response. Um, and it's kind of a hack. And he decided with basically, this is my object access protocol, and it's really simple. I'm going to call it SOAP. Unfortunately for Don, this kind of hack took off, uh, and we all started building SOAP systems. And then it went mad. We had WS specs and everything else, about, and we kind of lost our way a little bit. So something that turned out to be basically that classic, um, it's a hackathon. I'm going to build basically an easier way of talking between two objects. It became a paradigm for an entire industry. But one of the good things that came out of SOAP was this idea of service-oriented architectures, this idea that we could break up our platform into a series of independent services that represented effectively a business capability. That's where this, all this, some of these ideas come from. So SOA1 was effectively based on SOAP. 
People decided SOAP was a bad idea. We created SOA2, which is based around messaging and events. The vendors said, we don't seem to be making enough money from this new idea of yours. Um, we were going to create a thing called the Enterprise Service Bus. So the Enterprise Service Bus was this idea that said, well, you've got these bits that are genuinely doing messaging, but you've got all these legacy platforms and things that only had database access, et cetera. And you know what? We'll put together this tool that lets you hook all that stuff together Essentially, so it all talks to each other, even if it's not all actually SOA. Oh, and if we're hooking everything together, why don't you just write the workflow inside our tool, hence things like BizTalk, right? The problem with that became is you ended up with all these CRUD-based services that just did nothing but, hey, save a thing, read, uh, update a thing, uh, read a thing. And all the, all the business logic went into the middle. Things like BizTalk were phenomenally hard to, say, to get under test. You can write TDD against a BizTalk workflow process. And also, essentially, your code was effectively running continually inside basically this enterprise service bus platform, not actually in your services. So along comes, comes a guy called Jim Weber. Jim Weber creates something called Gorilla SOA. Jim says, basically, this is nonsense. SOA is really great. We've got this idea of separate services, but they should just talk to each other via HTTP and JSON, or essentially some lightweight message broker like Rabbit, right? This idea called smart um, endpoints and dumb pipes. Okay. And there's a whole fork that happens over here. Jim talks to a guy called Fred George. Fred George basically is the guy behind Program Anarchy. The Program Anarchy says basically, the first thing we do, we fire all the product managers. The second thing we do, we fire all the QAs. The only thing that exists is developers talking to customers. Oh, and every service should be about 100 lines long. Uh, and because it's 100 lines long, you'll throw it away after six months. You won't write any tests. Um, uh, uh, and it's like the cells in the body. And that was kind of extreme microservices, right? And the uh, extreme SOA. And the problem with extreme SOA, because it used this term microservices, was it's created this kind of like legacy -like concept of, oh, my service should be really small and be 100 lines, et cetera, that kind of thing. And that results, unfortunately, in a bit of an anti pattern we call nano services. They're far too small. Um, uh, and they just create lots of distribution without much necessarily value. But um, the Jim Weber model effectively is very similar to what Adrian was doing basically with SOA effectively at Netflix. And people like Martin Fowler and James Lewis came together and effectively said, let's create the name for this thing and we call it microservices. So microservices are SOA. And if they are SOA, they really fall under this notion of what we call the four tenets of service-oriented architecture. So you can think of SOA3, right? And Don Box of SOAP fame defined what he called the four tenets. And he said, essentially, a number of important things. The first is boundaries are explicit. And this is very similar to the Jeff Bezos email. It says, the only way you get to talk to my service is through an API. And by API, we could mean HTTP. We might equally mean AMQP for messaging. We might mean gRPC. It doesn't matter as long as there's an API of some sort, right? And then what top one, compatible API policy, essentially means let's all agree on whatever the protocol is that we're using so that you're not saying, I was supposed to great service in gRPC, and you go, oh, I always wanted to use HTTP call you. Um, let's agree what that's going to be. And services are autonomous, says this must be an independently deployable unit. I cannot have any dependencies that mean I can't deploy on my own schedule. And if my boundaries are explicit, anything inside Nobody outside is allowed to touch or see my database or my code, right? They can only talk to it through the API. So that means I'm independently deployable because I'm never going to have a problem where I say, I'm changed the database schema, and you go, that's broken me. That won't happen because I own the database schema, in fact, in the tables that I use. I'm never going to have a problem that I change the structure of my code because you don't talk to my code. You talk effectively to my boundary layer at the API. It's one of the reasons we say things like don't directly expose your entities from your domain model out basically on your API. Because if I change my internal entity, I don't want the API to change. And the reason for that is, that is the point of coupling. That's my contract with other people. And it needs to be stable. Okay. Because if every couple of hours I say, I've changed the API again, you're not going to win many friends in the rest of the organization, right? When they go down the pub, it's going to be you they're talking about. Right. So you want some kind of stable external contract which offers a service to other people, and you want to be independently deployable. So really, you want to have something that's basically 
uh, coarse-grained enough to represent a unit of functionality that essentially means people won't have to feel tempted to talk to you inside, your API essentially says, we cover this particular responsibility. Right. And share schema not types just about the fact that most of us now work in heterogeneous environments where you know, one team's working in Java, another team's working in Go, another team's working in uh, .NET, and someone's decided they're going to deploy Rust, right? That's just the reality of lots of enterprises today. So if, if you share schema, that means that we can all interoperate. If I start sharing .NET assemblies as my main me mechanism of interoperation, it's not going to work. Right. So good microservices will basically exhibit the, the usual properties, basically, of good quality software in that they basically will have strong cohesion and low coupling. That makes them stable, right? This stuff all dates back to the 1990s and basically a structured uh, design, right? I think it's the 90s. It could be the 80s. I'm old. OK. Um, so we can say, for example, that microservices require common closures. A so common closure is a property of packaging that uh, basically Bob Martin defined in his book on kind of agile software development. And it says essentially uh, our package or our unit of deployment, things inside it should be subject to the same forces of change, right? They should want to change for the same reason. So if I have a service oriented around the check-in process basically at my hotel, it will change because I want to alter things to do with check-in, right? If I have something to do with the occupancy in the hotel, it will change because we want to do something about how customers are billed for using the minibar, et cetera, okay? And what we don't want is services that have different reasons to change. Well, we are going to change if we change the booking process as well as basically doing check-in for a customer at the desk, right? We want to basically make it possible that you don't change for both reasons. And the partitions need to be stable. It doesn't really matter whether I'm going to use basically messaging between my um, services <coughs> or I'm going to use more, more of a, a request-driven architecture. I need to be stable. So the first thing is my consumers, my clients, my guys running the iPhone, the Android, effectively the guys doing web development, they want a stable contract, right? The guys doing basically iOS don't want to have to ship every week because it's a pain in the ass getting through the Apple store, right? So you want a reasonably stable contract for them. We want contracts between our services to be stable. The other microservices don't want to have to constantly keep changing because you've changed your message format, your API. So to do that, we need to essentially pick boundaries we can define reasonably stable contracts for. So how would we pick a boundary that has a reasonably stable contract? Well, what we need to do is look at what the, it is we're modeling, what is the business we're modeling, and <coughs> seek out the stable contracts within the business. What interactions in the business are stable and well-defined, such that when we automate them and use those as our partitions, we will basically benefit from those stable boundaries. And probably we will find that when we look for those partitions, they are the ones the business understands as being partitions into our software and the way it works. All right. Just checking on the time to see how I'm doing for progress. My phone can't recognize my face at this distance. OK, good, one time. All right, so this is where we get to this phrase that called organized business capability. Anyone who's read Martin Fowler and uh, uh, James Lewis's paper on microservices? A few of you. How many of those of you who read that had any idea what they meant by business capabilities? Just a quick question. Kind of one half person, or two half people over there. All right. Because people use this phrase, business capabilities, and it dates really from SOA era. Um, and unless you really understand the history of, of microservices back to SOA, it's unlikely you can follow the path to find out people talking about business capabilities and what they were about and why people thought that was a good um, <laughs> definition, effectively, for what a microservice boundary should be. OK. So. So the key is we want to basically find something that the business might recognize as a process boundary because that's more likely to have um, change based on effectively a product goal that is effectively changing one component at a time. 
So Tori, this slide is a bit heavy on text. Um, what is a business capability? So a business capability actually is how an organization delivers service to its customers. And it consists of a number of things. It consists basically of people, because we may deliver to you as a customer by using a process of talking to you or writing something on a piece of paper, right? If I go and buy something in Starbucks, there's basically a barista who makes my coffee. There's a cashier who essentially takes the money from me, right? So there are people involved. There's some knowledge, basically, effectively. Well, someone has to know how to make coffee, right? Um, someone has to know how to work the till system that basically is involved. There are basically organized instructions and delivery models, right? So there's a manager, effectively, who's looking after the staff. There are delivery models. There's a Starbucks model where, effectively, I go up and order at the counter, and they fill out the cup and pass it on, which is efficient. There's the cost of model where the same person that takes the money makes the coffee, and we all stand in a line for ages and regret our choices in life, right? Um, so just a quick aside. So basically, Costa is effectively why you don't do uh, distributed transactions anymore, because Starbucks had a better model, right? There's a famous paper called Starbucks doesn't do two-phase commit. Uh, and so what happens is that when I go to Costa is essentially I'm saying there's a transaction which involves all the components, basically, all the services that need to be, needs to be completed in order for me to get service, right? The, uh, he has to basically take the money, has to go to the counter, get the cup, make my coffee, and hand it back to me. Meantime, everyone's queuing behind me. It doesn't scale very well. Starbucks figured that out, and it said, what happens is I basically take your request, I put it in a message, which is a cup, and I put the message basically in a queue. And then a worker process, which is the barista, comes along and removes the message from the front of the queue, basically makes your coffee, and when it's made, it goes down to the far end where you're kind of waiting, basically, for this asynchronous process to complete, and it scales much better. Right? And most of you are going to go away from this. And your boss is going to say, what did you learn? And he said, we should learn, we should build our software like um, Starbucks, not, not, not Costa, and that's fine. Um, OK. But what you're essentially using all these people and stuff to do is to basically deliver a process. The process in the Starbucks instance is basically make Ian a drink, a hot, a hot beverage. Right? Make Ian his black Americano. OK. And so make drinks is the process. And really, although people talk about SOA being aligned to capabilities, from a point of view of us discovering reasonable boundaries, really what we care about is SOA is aligned to a process. Okay. And so basically back in the day in SOA uh, literature, a guy called Nikolai Gisettis essentially said, a service should represent a self-contained functionality that corresponds to a real-world business activity. as a process which basically may sometimes be divided into activities or tasks. Right. So what you want to look for is the process because the capability includes your software, which is automating the process. Right. So we're talking about the capability actually includes the microservice automating the process. Okay. Um, a, capa a process is usually defined by basically a verb and a noun, right? So make lunch or prepare a bill. And a capability is usually defined by a noun on its own, so catering or accounting. So basically, the process of make lunch is delivered by the capability in my organization called catering. The process called prepare bill is delivered by the capability in my organization called accounting. Some folks like to basically use the capability as the microservice boundary. <coughs> So creating and accounting, uh, I think it's actually probably better to use the process, basically, because that's what you're looking to automate. Because the capability is how we deliver the process, including use of technology, right? And it's worth bearing in mind that you know when people do this kind of analysis, they may decide actually you don't need to automate this at all. Um, this should be a manual process, or just use a spreadsheet, right? So. We may only be automating some parts of what the business actually does, but one of the things that you're trying to do to find a process to say is to say, what does this business do? What are the services we deliver to our customers? What are the processes our customers go through in order to get stuff done, right? The example we'll look at later is basically, I, 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 I used to talk about hotels, because I never worked in hotels, so it's clear I'm not talking about everywhere, somewhere where I've worked, so the PR department had to check my slides anyway. Um, and I always say, and I apologize to people basically who work in hotels, and no one ever works in hotels. 
we're running a course for two days, basically with messaging with some guys that work on hotel software, so which is kind of like never usually my big win. So, but I do apologize. If you work in hotel software, it's probably rubbish, but it's a good example because we all understand how hotels work. Um, but working in a hotel, what I want to do is look at the processes that I need to do to service my guests, right? I've got some, I want to take bookings and reservations. I want to check people in. I want to check people out. I've got a food and beverage department that basically says, I, there's a bar where you can buy drinks or, or coffee. I make you food and send it to you by room service. That's, the, that's what my business does, right? It, it's effectively delivering all those things to customers. And that's what I'm looking for is the boundaries to put my microservices around. Those processes that the organization uses to deliver. All right. So there are different techniques you can use. I'm going to explain a couple of them that I think actually are, are usable. Um, but there are many others out there. It's a whole field called business architecture. And we can't do the, all of business architecture in this time frame. So I think value stream mapping is really useful. Uh, value stream mapping essentially originally comes much more from a kind of Six Sigma um, uh, lean style enterprise movement where essentially you're going in basically down to the factory floor and attempting to remove waste from the process and improve it. And usually when it's done in a Six Sigma contest, a context, you are for trying to find the current state and then essentially you determine what your, you propose what your future state's going to be in order to really cut waste out of the process, right? So it's a little bit more than we need. We'll show you the whole process and then we'll talk about how we can kind of shortcut most of that. Generally, the process involves you have some kind of kickoff meeting, and you all agree the most important part of this is we're we all going to agree with each other the scope of what we're going to try and model. Don't try and boil the ocean. You're really trying to look for one given cut flow of how a customer gains value from your, from, from your business. Okay. So, what's the, so, the customer, so you think about the customer wants to do something, what is the process? that leads them getting values. The one we're going to show today, an example of is the customer wants to book a room, the customer then wants to come to a hotel and check in, the customer wants to stay with the hotel, the customer wants to check out. In hospitality industry, it's referred to as the guest cycle. Okay? But agree what the scope is, because you will have many possible customer interactions, and you, eat, you need to do a separate exercise for each of them. Okay. What you do essentially is you walk the process. Now, essentially, if you're some kind of Six Sigma lean guy, this means going down on the, on the floor with the shop workers and seeing actually how the cars are made. Um, we may just need to effectively find that. We might find that's difficult. We may find that's easy. If you can, it's a good idea. If you can't, basically, that's where you get some kind of customer expert who essentially explains the process to you that goes on. Right. Generally speaking, the, the reason people try and walk the floor is because what people think the process is, if you talk to a manager, is generally not what the process is when you actually talk to the staff who do the work, right? Somebody in head office, basically, at Costa, probably believes they have the most fantastic process for delivering coffee ever invented, and he has a lovely chart on his wall of how it works, and it's never been run in a single Costa in the country, right? That's the only explanation I can give. Um, someone works for Costa, by the way, I'm deeply sorry. Uh, um, so you do this walk, and what you're looking for when you basically do the walk is to see where effectively there are kind of handoffs or time gaps, because they indicate when one process finishes and another one starts. So when we look at the hotel example, we'll see that someone tries to basically look for a room to reserve. They're trying to find something. They're searching by you know, area or postcode in Google. They'll go to some aggregator site, effectively, that's a step. I'm looking for a room. The next step is basically now having found one, I will then try and basically book a room at the hotel I want, et cetera. Generally speaking, the rule that the lean, the lean guys give is you, you really want to push anything down to about five to 15 process steps, right? And uh, don't go more grandly than that. We will show you a little bit later how you can go more grandly than what the value stream guys do, because it may be useful to you. OK. Um, then we map the layouts. In other words, what we do, basically, we go and find a big room with a whiteboard. <coughs> butcher paper is what everyone refers to. Usually, I've never seen butcher paper available in an office. I've been in just have whiteboards. But you stick post-it notes to it. One at the top is the customer. And then you basically stick post-it notes across the whiteboard, effectively, to represent the individual process steps. So um, hopefully, you can see that. If we stuck one up for customer, 
We say the first process in our guest cycle of booking a room at our hotel is essentially the reservation is proce uh, inquiry process where essentially we're saying, I want to try and find somewhere to book for my lovely holiday in Nottingham. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, and um, uh, so that generally belongs to a functional area, which is basically the marketing department, right? Because it's some kind of basically SEO optimized kind of like, um, let's get the stuff out there. Then basically we say, all right, don't worry if you can't read this all in the back, I'll, I will say what they are basically, just to see the process, there's not much detail you care about. Um, but then we say basically I'm gonna make a booking, which so generally belongs to the reservations department, right? Please make a booking for me. Then essentially I'm gonna say, um, uh, I'm gonna check in, right? So the customer actually arrives basically at the desk. Notice that one of the things we can see here is that there are time gaps, right? between essentially, well, or handoffs, between me finding stuff and getting a Google link and following it and either getting to an aggregator or your own site. The process of making a booking, which will result in success or failure of a booking, and then there's a time gap to when I basically choose to check in at the front desk and say, hey, I reserved a hotel, basically a room in the hotel, can I check in please? Then there's a whole process where effectively I'm now an occupant of the room, right? And for the check-in process, the reason for this guest cycle, the reason that's important is actually the next step. When I check out, they present me with a bill for my misjudged use of the minibar after I came home with one sherbet too many in my bloodstream, right? Um, uh, when those Toblerone bars and that packet of Pringles look really, really tempting, even though I wouldn't normally eat any of them. And what happens is you can then do basically what's called a reverse walk sometimes, where essentially you say, when someone checks out, what are the artifacts that we're likely to basically give them? We're gonna give them a bill. How do we get the items on that bill? Okay, that must have come from uh, occupancy, basically recording charges against effectively you during your stay, et cetera, right? By the way, don't build a hotel, hotel system based upon my random post-it notes. Um, it may have nothing to do with how hotels work. Um, I don't accept any responsibility if you sue me for that. Okay. Then we can actually, if we're, so if we're going to do basically a um, full on uh, um, a value stream mapping process, we've kind of done stream mapping and then what happens is you do a second pass and add value. And generally what happens is in the value stream mapping process, they're looking for a number of things. Process time, how long does it take to process the actual individual uh, steps that someone needs to accomplish? So going back to the cost on Starbucks example, for example, how long does it take someone to actually make a cup of coffee or ring up the cash job? And you get the lead time. The lead time basically says, how long does it actually take for you to, for that, that process to happen when you account for delays and stuff? So from the point I arrive in Costa to the point effectively I get my coffee, is that essentially a lot longer than the point of the, the process for Starbucks? Because effectively I've got a longer lead time due to queuing, right? And so you might look, for example, at your checkout process and you might say, well, the process time to do a checkout may be basically a couple of minutes. Maybe we could shorten that. But maybe the bigger problem is that you only ever have one person on the checkout desk and actually people are queuing waiting to check out. So my lead time is long, even though my process time is short. Okay. And then you can also look at percentage of completion rates. So you can say how many of these things are successful. Um, it's obviously more important when I'm making things like widgets in car factories, et cetera, to do that. But obviously there are some journeys that are basically a, a fail anyway. Then you add those details to this, don't worry that you can't read it, because we're going to show you another diagram. You scribble them on the post-it notes, and then generally what happens is someone goes away and produces something that looks a bit like this. This is a value stream mapping diagram, and you can see effectively what we've got here is kind of lead time and process time uh, written in a timeline at the bottom. And we have the individual processes, which are basically have a name for the process, which usually is a kind of verb, plus noun, I don't know why I haven't got occupy a room better than occupancy, uh, a function, which basically the department tends to deal with that, number of people involved, if there are people, and then lead time and process time and completion rates. Okay, and that is what a value stream mapping exercise tends to give you. And that is where we're looking for a candidate for a microservice, right? Make booking. That looks like a candidate for a microservice. It's a process, it's well-defined, any hotel I go to has probably got a guest cycle that looks a bit like this and probably has a process called make booking. That's where I want to build microservices. It should be stable because effectively most, most organizations of a similar form will need at some point to do a make booking process. Okay. 
Um, and it should be basically a product because I can begin to do things like say to the product manager, okay, um, when people land on the booking page, only 60% of people who start the booking journey complete it. Try and improve that. Let's get to 80% of customers in, in, uh, basically making it through the booking process to the end, right? And that's the product you're working on, the booking experience as a team. All right. Now, we don't need a lot of the stuff that um, value stream mapping is giving us because we're not really looking at current to future state. So we can, in our heads, actually just simplify to that, really. You don't have to do the whole exercise. You can just say that's basically the key processes in the cycle, and those are the microservice candidates that I care about. Okay. However, one slight problem we might hear is, well, hang on a minute. <coughs> My hotel software is now the best in the industry. We have got basically uh, growth off the charts, um, uh, and we want to hire more people. And this model kind of has given us a few teams, five teams. So, oh, by the way, another thing I should mention here is um, you do this exercise for a whole load of processes. So I've probably got more than five actual microservices, and some of these processes may pop up in other, uh, in other flows, right? So the value stream essentially around um, the food and bed beverage services in your hotel is probably likely to include this occupancy process if that's how we're basically recording a bill for customers when they check out at the end of the day. So really, I'm doing a whole load of these and coming up with a set of candidate processes. But it may be that I don't have enough processes for the number of teams. Just the, I can't even remember. It's like 700 of developers right now, right? Which is a huge numbers of teams. And just looking at the processes for how you order your takeaway on a Saturday night is probably not going to give me enough division. <coughs> so what I then look at is basically activities and tasks. So the activity is just a bit more fine-grained. What essentially happens during that make booking process? Tasks are a bit lower level, um, and tasks are probably not great candidates for us to worry about this level for microservices, because tasks are something like effectively, you know, enter uh, customer registration, enter guest registration details. Well, that's probably not as useful to me as basically register guest, which is the activity, rather than the specific task I do during that process. And many of those tasks will be manual and not even automated. So then I can look for activities. You'll notice that some of them basically are shared. Right? So <coughs> one advantage of going to this next level is I may be able to pull out shared uh, uh, microservices that effectively can service multiple processes. Uh, so checking availability of rooms, uh, registration process, making payments, billing guests. It may well be that multiple, uh, at the activity level, it's easier to see some commonality I can break out to have a microservice that is usable in multiple uh, value stream flows. Okay. Um, APQC, which is basically American something or other, um, but you can find them online. They essentially do a lot around process mapping, and they define these five levels. So they basically say level three is the process. That's the one we want to first we'll think about as our candidate for microservices. Level four, activities. So basically, it's the other one we might think about if we've got a lot of teams. Um, and then tasks are below them. And then they group them in processes and categories, which can be useful for organizational purposes. OK. Well, if you break down into activities, just be wary of what we're talking about, the entity service model, right? I don't want to do this, where effectively I have these really CRUD-based services. Because the trouble with these CRUD-based services is that effectively they don't contain the business process logic. And that will then float up, and you'll end up with something you'll call basically a gateway or an orchestrator or something like that. And that will actually have all of your process. So this is a bit like the OO problem we call feature envy, when essentially I've got a whole lot of properties on my class, and it turns out the caller understands the business logic, not the class that contains the state. Right? And the problem here is exactly the same. These microservices contain the state. But what they really want is the business processes associated with the state to be with them, not to be placed in this other class that basically is orchestrating everything, right? And you can get into weird places with things like sagas and stuff where effectively you've moved all of your business logic way out of your service and into some um, uh, external layer. You want to avoid that? You want to look much more like the one on the bottom, where effectively I have a piece of work and it's flowing through a number of services in order to basically complete, which is exactly the model that's really happening in your business. You're trying to model the reality of how business works, because that will end up with you being more successful. Okay. 
Yeah, this is what we mentioned earlier. Essentially, there are a whole load of these. You will effectively find many of them. You just do a cross kind of like of them all will eventually get where you need to go. Um, APQC makes some off-the-shelf models available. Loads of basically consultancies will offer to sell you an off-the-shelf model or processes for just your business. Caveat mTOR, you know. Um, but you can just, it's useful here if anyone can see it. You can see here we've got a category market on product services within which basically we've got some uh, process groups, perform customer market analysis, which, which we've got a process, perform analysis, which there are activities inside, like identify market segments, conduct customer market research. Note that these are not all necessarily things you're going to automate, but we're talking about modeling a process for the organization. Okay. Um, SOA, traditionally, one of the things that happen with SOA is teams doing SOA transformation often got involved in business process reorganization projects because the uh, IT guys went away and said, how does the process work? And when they discovered how the process worked, they said, we have two problems. One is how to build the software. The other is your process. OK. Another one turned to the value stream mapping, um, event storming. Anyone done event storming exercises? Event storming is very cool. Alberto Brandolini basically created this out of the DDD community. Um, so uh, his idea was eventually to try and basically model using events. So basically, he has this thing called domain event. And he says, what we're initially going to do is figure out what are all the events that occur in a given stream, basically, for my business. And usually, you're trying to model something specific. You can model your whole enterprise. That's a quite ambitious target. Um, but uh, you tend to basically model one specific flow that you're worried about. And then he says, basically, any event is triggered either by basically a timer or a command that basically comes into an aggregate or an external system and generates that event. So basically, a command comes along and does some transformation operation. And we raise an event to show the results of that command. And then we can take events and create a read model for the UI. And we can take events and basically run them through a policy and generate new um, event and new commands. So what does it look like? So similarly before, basically the first thing we do is we agree what basically we're going to try and model, and then we do what's called chaotic exploration. We whack post-it notes onto the board that represent events in our sequence. You probably can't read it at the back. Don't worry. Um, uh, so things like room reserved, payment complete, booking confirmed, guest registered, room allocated. These represent stages of things that will have happened during the, the, the guest check-in process where a significant event will have occurred we might want to record. Don't worry if you can't see the post-it notes. A, my slides are on GitHub, and B, it's probably wrong. That's not how a hotel works. Right. So you just know there's a whole lot of orange, orange post-it notes that represent events that have happened in the system. OK. Now then you go and add the systems and people. So you say, well, where does that event come from? Right. So that event is generated either by some kind of person, that's the small yellow notes, raising some kind of command, or maybe it's generated by a timer, for a command, so reservation time would be basically something that's saying, um, uh, hey, you only have a certain amount of time to basically book this room, and then I'll time you out and make it available to somebody else, for example. Right? Um, and then effectively, you get external systems like payments and email that you want to include. Um, but these aggregates, which, which basically drive the, which the command basically mutates to basically create an event, are the key to understanding the outcome of when I'm running one of these processes. I've actually got a great book about it. I recommend if you want to run one of these internally, you go read his book. I can't explain to you in five minutes how to do it. Um, but I want to give you an idea. OK. Then essentially, you do a walkthrough. So you basically say, I'm a customer. What would happen to me as I go through? And then you can do a reverse walkthrough, just like you do the value stream mapping, and start at the other end and say, um, hey, I'm checking out where did all the bits, the bits I need to come from. We do some at Just Eat occasionally talking about our key order flow. We do ones that basically say, I'm a customer placing an order. The other one just says, my food has arrived at my door. What happened to get it there? Right. Um, OK. And that means I can then identify what are the aggregates. And they, again, may be key ideas we can use to try and find our microservice boundaries. Now, there are also external systems here. Basically, they may well be some microservice we care about as well. Um, Aggregates are potentially a bit smaller than the kind of process model you get from a value stream map. And that may be OK, 
what you want to watch for is this idea that basically, if you, if you model only aggregates as microservices, you may actually have a cluster of aggregates that are all subject to the same forces of change. Otherwise, they have common closure, and you should group them together for your microservice, right? Otherwise, you're going to say, well, every time I change stuff in this team, this team has to change stuff too. Probably put those two aggregates in common closure in the same system. Um, I like this. It's really easy to do and quite fun um, and doesn't carry some of the overhead of value stream mapping that uh, comes from basically being used in different contexts. But the identification of processes in value stream mapping is really useful. Sometimes run both. So we, we, we quite often do both and then figure out what, what it tells us, right? The more, the more viewport, more models you have, the easier it may be to find basically what you think is really going on. Bounded contexts. So. When people talk about model partitioning microservices, a common thing you will hear is people say, you find your bounded contexts, and then essentially that gives you your microservices, right? That is kind of not how bounded contexts work. Okay, so a bounded context for Eric is essentially a set of boundaries in terms of team organization, code bases, and data schemas. And he says, essentially, we can't necessarily get to a situation where we have 20 teams where everyone's going to agree what the model for, say, um, a guest uh, reservation looks like. Because we may want to do different things with it. Right? And rather than accumulate all the possible information for all the possible use cases in one giant thing where my actual Microsoft only processes a tiny part of it, what I do is basically deal with the, the, the fields and data that I care about and then have to basically say, well, if I care about this part of reservation, you care about that part of reservation, we have to model how we're going to interact. And most of what's called context mapping in D, uh, DDD is really about that problem space. So saying, you've got this model, I've got that model, how do they talk to each other? And bounded context are really a diagnostic tool used to, used to basically identify that. So it's kind of clear with a microservice that because we have basically one team looking after it, because essentially it contains inside it a model in code and a model in the schema, and essentially because we consider it usually a continuous integration boundary, in other words, every, if something in here changes, everything in here is then potentially deployable, then effectively it has what Eric calls the ubiquitous language. The model is here is, has to be consistent because we have to agree what reservation means with inside this scope. So a microservice is a bounded context, right? By definition of what a bounded context is and, and what definition of what a microservice is, they are the same thing. But this is typically a, this is a monolith, right? I could have multiple teams working on my monolith. They're looking at the code which is contained within inside the monolith, and they're looking at the schema inside the monolith. And they could be consistent about the definitions of the code and the schema contained within the monolith. They could have they will probably have to do CI over the whole monolith, which is part of the problem with the monolith. <coughs> so in fact, they have ubiquitous language too. In their case they have built a really large bounded context around their microservice. Okay. Both of them are bounded contexts. So bounded contexts are not a way to basically discover microservices. But once you have microservices, you're reducing the size of the bounded context to be a microservice. So microservices are a strategy for having smaller bounded contexts. Right? That makes sense. Because I see a lot of people talking about bounded contexts, and they're not talking about them right. Okay. Um, you're, when you're, the way you find the bounded context is to basically find the processes, etc. All right. How am I doing? Right, about two minutes. Okay, almost there. Um, okay. Um, oh, just at the end, basically. Oh, what happened there? Okay. We'll we'll make this work. Don't worry. Um, independent deployability. So effectively, inside the microservice boundary, you can use any one one of a number of strategies basically to um, get working. Uh, well, I think we're fine. Um, you can use RPC to communicate between two, basically, uh, processes inside it. You can use messaging. You can use a shared database model. You can use file sharing. You can have multiple processes inside a microservice. You're obviously going to have at least a database in your code. So you've already got two, right? But you can actually have a worker process that does async work. Because you're looking to, at, the, at the problem of how do I scale parts of my microservice independently of each other for, for, for work. But across microservice boundaries, because I want independent deployability, I only can really use messaging and RPC. 
because I can't use databases effectively because that's shared scheme, which will break my independent deployability. And, uh, I've, and file transfer kind of could work, but we tend to just use messaging across microservices. All right. So we basically have a problem with independent operability. All right. Um, we're running out of time, so basically uh, I will say roughly. Um, so what we need to do in order to make success of microservices is recognize what they are for. And what microservices are for are about you essentially scaling your development organization by allowing multiple teams to work efficiently together to deliver for you without getting each other's way. And your goal is to get those multiple teams in a position where they can deliver at will many times a day based on effectively <coughs> pulling items off your backlog which is essentially oriented around business metrics which move forward the dial on a given piece of your product and that team just keeps pushing their way through that backlog making their portion of the project better. We may, we don't mention it earlier because it's kind of like of course you are going to get some pieces of program work that get centrally dictated that you're going to have to conform to as a team but most of your work should be in that product backlog. All right? And Finding processes or using effectively um, uh, event modeling is a way essentially of trying to figure out what those microservice boundaries are such that we're orienting to units of change that the business understands and can create metrics around that are stable and long lived such that we won't have to keep changing our boundaries and our shape. All right. Okay. Um, we probably don't have time for questions. I am around. Uh, you can come and just talk to me. I'm quite friendly, I promise. Uh, my, my, I am iCooper on Twitter. My DMs are open. If you'd rather ask questions in private, you can just DM me and I will answer questions as and when I can. Um, please remember to vote. You put the green ticket in the box or they press the green button and then that's a vote. Uh, the red tickets are not a vote. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>